Oh, okay, great. <laughs> Sorry, I haven't done this in a while. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we're going to call our meeting to order. <clears throat> Today is October 16th, 2018. This is a business meeting of the North Kingstown School Committee. If I could ask everyone to please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty, Thank you. Madam Clerk, could you please call the roll? Here. 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 Thank you. And if you could call the calendar, please. Thank you. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming tonight. Um, we're going to run this meeting a bit differently than our usual school committee meetings. So just to let you know uh, the order of business and it tracks what you'll see on the agenda if you uh, grabbed one. Um, we're going to have a presentation on the details of our November 2018 bond referendum uh, for school and town projects. <clears throat> and what we're going to have are sort of three components to that presentation. The first is going to be a uh, presentation about the athletic complex. Um, the other would be uh, the other school projects that we'd like to do. And finally, um, Mr. Mollis will be speaking on the uh, town side of the bond and the projects the town would like to accomplish. Um, for the format, um, we'd ask um, at the end of each of those sections, we will allow for questions and answers from the public. You do not need to sign up for that. So if you would like to ask a question of the presenters of each of those portions when they're done, you can come up to the microphone. Um, as usual, we'd ask that you please state your name and address. Um, and it's for questions, uh, not so much, uh, you know, like a comment and lecture. Uh, the, um, after the conclusion of the presentations, on our agenda, you'll see that we do have citizens' comments. That is our traditional citizens' comments, um, which does not allow for a back and forth. So if you have something that you'd like to uh, speak to the committee about, that would be the time to do that. There is a sign-up sheet for that, and we'd ask that you please, as our usual policy, limit any comments to three minutes at that point. Um, so, um, Dr. Jay, if you want to start and introduce some of our speakers tonight. Good evening, everyone, and thank you all for coming. I know there's a big baseball game going on right now, and that, uh, I really appreciate you, you being here for this. It's a really uh, good session to, good chance to learn about this bond and what is included and, and get all of your questions answered. So tonight we're going to start with uh, representatives from PAR Engineering, specifically Arthur Eddy, who's a landscape architect for PAR Engineering, and he is going to begin by showing us some of the details about the track and field complex project. Now the track and field project comes in at roughly, uh, the, the entire bond is a $27 million bond that's split halfway between the school department and the town, so 13 and a half million to the school department. And this project alone is about 3 million of, that, of, that, of those funds. So Arthur Reddy, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Superintendent. Thank you, school committee members. Uh, thank you, uh, Town Administrator Mollis, and thank you folks from the public for coming out tonight. Um, quickly again, um, I'm gonna run through a quick an agenda that's gonna look at the field itself that exists today, some of the site improvements, I'm gonna talk a little bit about synthetic turf options, and then how do we build it in the end and keep quality control. Um, part of the team is Park Corporation. Dave Potter's here as the project engineer. Gary Dubois here is the PM for the project. I'm Arthur Reddy. I'm a principal and owner of Traverse Landscape Architects uh, here in Providence, and Justin Robert Shaw, who is the PM for my office as well. And also with us, who's not pictured here, um, is Jim Partridge from Ed Rouse, who's doing some of the architectural improvements. Completed work. What we've done today over the last year, we've done some background investigations. We've been looking into what is out there, um, getting survey, geotechnical studies, looking at the soils, trying to understand exactly how we're going to build this field, and started to put schematic design together and put some probable, probable cost opinions together, which is how we got to the bond at this point. 
Currently, we're in the preparation of construction plans and specifications, and then permitting the project, so that in the beginning of 2019, February, March, we'll bid the project and then build the project in the summer of June through August 2019. So in that summer period, we'll return over the field at the end of August for the use for the school at that time and for the community. Looking quickly at the site, this is the building we're obviously in. When we look at the site, we kind of divided it into three pieces, the parking, the high school, and the athletics, which is on the east side of the location. When we look at the site itself, the project area, we're looking at the existing stadium and the rear field in the back and the throwing area in the back. And one of the things that you see here is the wetlands. Obviously, we're landlocked. We can't expand uh, to expand the site itself due to the wetlands to the, to the south. When we look in the field, what we're looking to do is flip the track, bring the straightaway with an eight-lane straightaway along the edge of the stadium, and then actually put uh, synthetic turf inside, upgrade storage utilities, and then look at improving um, ADA access and code compliance in the restrooms and concession stands. We're going to re rebuild the backfield, move javelin, and reorganize hammer shots so that we actually gain a grass field. That'll be a sodded grass field, and I'll talk a little bit about that um, as we move forward. Um, and again, when we look at that backfield, one of the advantages of sodding and rebuilding that backfield is the field that you own currently is a sand-capped field. Um, we're going to use the sand that's coming out of that field to rebuild the field in the back. So we're going to use that material. Instead of hauling it off-site, um, there's, a, there's a cost savings to reusing and rebuilding that backfield. Um, we're going to refurbish, as I said, we're going to reorganize jumping areas inside the new synthetic turf area. So we'll have long jump, triple jump, pole vault, and high jump with inside the athletic facility. And one of the big things we're doing is flipping that track. And the reason we're doing that is it really, when you're running a track meet and you have, you actually have a really nice athletic facility with your stands, your concession stands, and your press box. But you're straight away when you're running, which are your big events, your 100, your 110 meters, is on the other side of the field. So we're going to flip that so that your stands can actually be utilized now for that event. Again, looking at just some of the things when we talk about storage, we're going to provide storage for athletic equipment. One of the things that we like to do is spread storage throughout the area. That helps with designating for sports and allowing for, um, to have storage areas for track, soccer, and move those things around so that they're in the appropriate places. We're looking at a new track surfacing. Your track surfacing has reached past its prime, so it's time to replace it regardless. Um, so that would be part of that. So you'll see a new track, and then obviously the synthetic turf field, and then also a new throwing area. Looking quickly, this is what we assume it'll look like. Again, lo relocating those throwing areas, a new grass field in the back, new synthetic turf field, inside the stadium. Again, a visual of what it would look like at night. So talk about synthetic turf and its benefits. Um, and one of the things that synthetic turf does is it gives you more hours of play compared to a natural grass field. And the reason that is grass can only sustain so much use. And when we look at sports, it really comes down to the hours of use that you're using a field. So if we look at a natural grass field, you typically get 25 hours for 25 weeks, which is about 625 total hours a year, as opposed to a synthetic turf field, which is about 37 hours a week and 52 weeks a year. And the reason for that is, as you can see on the bottom, you can use it in all types of weather. And one of the things that you'll see in the early spring are cancellations for practices, cancellations for games, same thing in the fall, especially this season, we've had a lot of rain. In the instance of a synthetic turf, we're extending that season because we're not canceling those days. And you can also use it more. So in this essence, you're really getting comparatively three fields in one. When we look at maintenance, well, maintenance, there's a reduction in maintenance. It's about a 33% reduction in maintenance. To maintain a good natural grass field at a peak performance is $18,000 a year. Whereas an average synthetic cost for maintaining a synthetic turf field is about $12,000 a year. 
what you see in a synthetic turf field is that that's an escalating scale. Your first four years, you're really not doing much, and then it escalates and to keep the longevity out of the field. So why do it? And in this instance, we talk a little about the wetlands and the ability to expand. It's supply and demand. Demands on athletic fields exceed the supply of available land. Additional sports increase demands on fields, creating fields unable to support a quality experience. One of the things that we've seen is in popularity is lacrosse has grown in the sport, which has put pressure on your fields in your spring season. Whereas in the past, you might have rested fields during football and soccer seasons, which are fall sports. Now we're running those fields consistently all through the year. Adding a synthetic turf field allows you to run all these sports continuously um, without the needed increase in maintenance. When we look at the three natural grass fields from a long-term cost, when, why the upfront costs outweigh the long-term costs, you would really have to build three fields comparatively to get the same amount of use. So if we took an a athletic field at $350,000, a typical field to build a grass field times three, added in the maintenance over the 10 years, and we are looking at a total cost of just under $1.6 million. A synthetic turf field has a high upfront cost at $1.1 million with adding in the maintenance over time of an overall cost of $1.2 million. So when you comparatively look at the use of those fields and cost-wise to get the same amount of, amount of use out, the cost is increasingly higher. When we further break that down, and this is a little complicated and I apologize, but when we further break that down, the yellow line on this graph represents cost per hour of use. So we look at what the hours of use over time is for the synthetic turf field. And the green line represents the synthetic turf field as cost per hour of use. In the first two to three years, you're obviously your grass cost per hour of use is, is lower because the cost of the field is lower. But over time, as you replace those fields at the 10 to 12 year replacement period, we start to catch up and we see in two to four years, your actual cost of use goes down significantly comparatively to the cost of use for grass. Um, and that continues out for 30 years. When you get to 30 years, you're almost, just almost at zero where those fields start to equate and you get your return on investment on those fields um, with a significantly reduction in the hour use of cost per hour use of field. It's a little complicated, but really what it's trying to show is over time, the value of the synthetic turf field is you're getting more hours out of it and you're using it more, which equates to more fields. The other thing that a synthetic turf field does, it also gives you the ability to use that field more and also rest your other fields so that when you do have fields that are down, you can use that field more. Our company takes a systems-based approach to synthetic turf fields. Um, we know for a well-performing athletic field is overlaying the information we put from users and stakeholders and also using science to understand how that field performs to give the best field that's on maintenance, durability, safety, and performance. And those are the four things we really weigh and we're really looking at how these systems operate. One of the first things we look at is turf. What is synthetic turf? There are not all synthetic turfs are the same. There are three different types of synthetic turf, which is a, it's called a monofilament, which is a single strand, and a slit film, which is a web, and a nylon, which is a thatch, which can go in the, inside of the turf. Each one of these performs differently. So we look at what are the best ways and what are the best turfs to meet your needs for the, for the town of North Kingstown. And when we look at it, is, monofilament is a great playing field great performance, great ball roll, and it looks like rail grass. When we look at slit film, slit film is a workhorse. It's really durable, um, will last long, but it kind of gets shiny and you get end up with a shiny effect um, and it lays down so it doesn't play as well. So we start to look at hybrids, which have come out in the industry, which is a mix of hybrids, which is the monofilament and the slit film. So that gives us both performance and that kind of durability that we're looking for. And the reason we like this field, especially in a place like North Kingstown is we're gonna have multiple different sports and how do those multiple different sports perform on that field and making sure that we're getting, it's not just a football field, it's not just a soccer field. You can play all those sports and we're getting the quality out of it, but we're also getting the long-term longevity out of it. 
Then we start to think about what is infill. And what infill basically is, is those fibers, if we just laid out that carpet, it would lay completely flat. So that carpet needs ballast to hold it down, and it also needs to hold those fibers up so those fibers stay up for play. This is probably the most controversial piece of the synthetic turf. There's SBR crumb rubber, which is ground up tires, which is mixed with sand. And basically that ground up uh, crumb rubber tire gives you your attenuation within the field, which is rubber, it's soft, so it's gonna bounce. In this instance, we've talked a lot about different types of infills, and one of the things that we're talking about here is an acrylic coated sand. And the reason we like it is because one, it gives a firm playing surface, so it has a performance aspect to it. Um, but it also, we're getting away from the concerns of SBR chrome rubber um, that are out there. In that, when we use a, a coated sand, like an acrylic coated sand, we take away that impact attenuation. Um, so we're taking away that kind of press piece. So what we do is we start to look at a shock pad underneath. Um, so a shock pad is basically a layer underneath that provides attenuation in it. So it's the softness in the field. Um, and one of the things that shock pads have done uh, has really reduced concussions and, and the, uh, what we've seen over time is a dramatic reduction in the risk of head injuries. Um, because that shock pad will provide a warranty um, to keep the, the, the pad in the field at a G-max um, that's low. So the lower the G-max, the better the field. The higher the G-max, the more concerned. A G-max that's out is like 200. This keeps it at about 100 to 120. Um, and we've seen high performance in these fields. A natural grass field, a natural grass playing field, lands somewhere between 80 and 100. And then this will fall right in line with that field. So we're taking that sand, we're getting a high performance flat, fast playing field with a quality turf that'll last and give you performance over a long period of time and also giving you a safe field from within that, that field component with the G-Max and the, the shock pad. And in the end, how do we make sure that the field is performing when we turn it over and it's constructed? So one of the things I just mentioned was G-Max testing. So G-Max is basically they go out and they drop a nine pound missile on the field. And it's not a missile, but it's a big metal clump and it gives a rating. The NFL has come out and said that the 165 is the maximum rating on G-Max that you can have. When at the ASTM says 200. So that's the point at which critical injury can happen. When we, Testing fields with shock pads, again, we're down at below 120. We've been testing in the 90s to 100 range. So we're really gonna bring that field down. We also look at and we worry about lower extremity injuries, twisting, so we look at things like vertical deformation, um, which is that rebound, so when you run, that force coming back up into your legs, so the softer that field is, the more you're gonna tire and your legs are gonna tire which opens you up to more, the potential for more injuries. So we look at vertical deformation. Both FIFA, which is the soccer and governing body, and World Rugby have done extensive studies to find out what, where are we comparatively to grass and what are those minimums. And those are the same um, testing recommendations we'll use on this field and make sure they're sure. The other is force reduction, is when we start to rotate our foot. Again, the concern on that lower extremity is I would plant my foot, is it gonna give? Whereas grass will give, this is, we're also looking at force reduction. So we're really looking at safety from a head, head injury concern, but also safety from a knee and lower extremity concern. Along with that, fields need to be groomed, fields need to be maintained. So as part of this contract, at the end when this is turned over to the town, we also look at making sure that you have the equipment you need to maintain it, but also as part of the contract is also having a professional come in on an annual, annual basis to make sure the field's performing exactly as it is. So the start of every season, you'll have your field will be in prime condition. Make sure it's staying within where it needs to within the warranty. And if there's any repairs to do, to repair them at that time. And that's all I have. Thank you. Questions? So, Yes, I so, um, was going to say if anyone has any particular questions on the athletic field component, 
I'd invite you to come up to the microphone. You're welcome to ask. If you could please state your name and address. Bill Moyd, 710 Old Baptist Road. Is that working? Uh, I don't think so. <clears throat> Hello? Um, might be the Sounds. switch, or, or can you tap Sounds. it, Bill? Oh, yep, you're good. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, good presentation. Thank you. Uh, what you're saying, uh, I support the athletic field. Uh, fine so far. I do have uh, some questions. In terms of the 1.1 million for the uh, AstroTurf, that doesn't include the track, right? No, it doesn't. That's so the track is another... Right. That, that would fall under the bond. That, yeah, but that's how, a calculated How much is the bond. track? Um, the track itself? Yeah. The, so relocating the track is roughly 450000 So the, inside the stadium, if you may, we're talking about a million one. Excuse me, a million five. Roughly right. Plus for that. Yeah. Plus, out of a $3 million bond. Plus some upgrades to the concessions and the restrooms to meet ADA. So that, that okay. number's in there. There's also some fencing, and there's also storage, and then equipment as well. I guess I don't really understand where the extra 1.5 million goes. <clears throat> but uh, you said, uh, are we aware of the current baseball field and the practice field and some of the issues that are, you know need to be addressed there, and have they been addressed? I can I can jump in on this. Um, Hello. Okay. There we go. Better? No, nope, not better. Can people hear me now? Okay. So, um, so the athletic field, as as Mr. Eddie pointed out, you know, the major parts of this project are the the track and the field, and we didn't talk much about the track yet, but the track um, is has not had uh, usability really for any kind of a meet since 2009. Um, it needs, it has needed, you know, like a rubberized resurfacing um, to make it safe, and so that is a major project, uh, part of this project as well. Um, part of the expense added to the track, and not just to, you know, resurface it, but to basically turn it around. Right now we have a track where the straightaway is on the far end of the field, which means that when um, parents come to watch their students in a track meet, they all want to cross the field to get to the other side. It makes it for spectators not an, really an enjoyable experience as it should be. So we want the, 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 part, you know, the fans to be staying in the stands area and have all have a very good view of, you know, those um, one-lane track items like a 100-yard dash. So that is an expense all by itself, just kind of turning everything around. There's, there's more added expense in that regard. Um, as Mr. Eddie pointed out, there are other projects, including ADA compliance things that we need to do with the bathrooms. There's redoing of the side fields involved in all of this. and. When we get to uh, the point that we've taken a vote and we have the next school committee meeting, there's going to be a lot of details about, okay, what goes into, you know, this project to get to roughly $3 million. But this bond has kind of allocated that we would have, you know, all of this taken care of, including, you know, maintaining the field on a regular basis, um, including those side fields. We don't want to do this and come up kind of short and not really be able to get the whole project done right. There are probably going to be a few things that we have to leave off because we don't want to exceed $3 million. But um, when you add it all together, we're in that zone. Uh, <clears throat> what I was referring to was, for example, there's a leach field that overlaps on the base baseball field. And as I understand that, that may be a technical problem. So I wonder if that was considered. And as well, as the current practice football field, which is known, it's like hard as a rock, okay, basically, is the site of the demolition materials that was left over from the old high school. It was never taken off site. So I'm concerned about that. So I think 
when you do your work in terms of looking at the uh, survey of the ground, you ought to look at that. But I'm also concerned about the fact that what you have illustrated to me is this was poorly designed from the get-go when it was first done. It was kind of like backwards, okay? Number two, I think you'll find that either the track was not designed properly or not installed properly. The former school committee, former town council, never looked at those things. And that's what concerns me about issues like that. I support what you're saying. We have to make sure and do our homework that, so that we're not wasting our taxpayers' money. Thank you. Thank you. Next, sir. Yep. And again, if you could please state your name and address. Hi, I'm Steve McLaughlin, 55 Captain John Whiteman Lane, North Kingstown. My questions are much easier, and I'm not near as well informed. So, um, what is the expected life of this field of, versus the, the term of the bond? So the synthetic turf itself uh, lasts about 10, 12 years. Um, the replacement is not the same as replacing the entire system. So at the 10 to 12 year mark, you're pulling basically the carpet up, the infill up. You're going to reuse the infill. You're going to reuse the shock pad and actually just put new carpet down. So the, the cost differential is different. So the and bond's 20 years, is that correct? 10 to 12 years. The, the, the bond itself. And is the cost of refurbishing that field after 12 included in the overall cost of that field? Um, I'm not as good at the term of the bond. Mr. Mollis, uh, you might know a little better. Sorry to put you on the spot there. So, so, so I just want to be sure. So it's a 20-year bond. So you are correct that the, the term of the repayment is longer than the overall lifetime of the field. And part of our calculation is going to be to ensure, you know, for, speaking from the school committee side, that we budgeted accordingly for that replacement going that's forward. That, so that's, that was included in the overall. Yes. And the other was, I followed the 52 weeks, but I, I, I in my mind, questioned the rationale that in the, the seasons we have here and the usability, that, and if we took a list of that, at the cost per use or cost per hour, factoring what the school year is, what our temperature is, uh, what that number would look like if we put it, did it based on a more reasonable expectation of the use of the field given our location in the country. And that, that is built off our location. I mean, it, obviously that number grows dramatically if you were in a place like Texas where you're not having winter months, you're not having. One of the challenges we have here are those real shoulder months and one of the f sports we're really seeing affected is in those that early lacrosse season and le and last year's a perfect example teams weren't even on fields until late April which right. you know if you're in a sport that's almost the end of your season right. so we're really expanding that shoulder season and one of the things you can do and again it's up to, it's up to you is you can play in the rain you can practice in the rain Right. So whereas you have a field now you can't use and you have to wait 24 to 48 hours to use that field. So you're really expanding that time. And the other thing that we look at is you can expand those hours. And what we've seen on these fields is usually community groups like uh, expanding into added hours to play later at night and earlier in the morning. So if I were to take and rationalize that number from 52 down to 40, that might change just because of the fringe seasons. It would yeah. change the differential between the cost of the current uh, seed versus hard, hard or turf. It just, in my, I guess that's what I was looking at that slide saying. Sure. 52 in my mind didn't work. Sure. Math. No, I understand that, but we've, we've kind of looked at this extensively and, and done a lot of research on where these fields are getting used and how much they're getting used. And if I could jump in for one minute, this sort of goes along with what you're saying. There's one part of the calculation that's not shown in those graphs, which is that there's some additional um, revenue potential with respect to um, renting out the field to outside groups. Um, now, we don't expect that that's going to be a gigantic number, but we are planning on using that um, towards offsetting some of the maintenance costs. Because right now, that football field can really only be used for varsity football games, while this field will have the opportunity of opening it up for other areas. Well, thank you for those clarifications. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Uh, traditionally, uh, our projects, uh, capital projects, uh, are some, we get some 30, 35 percent refurbishment and reimbursement for the state. I don't believe this is, avail this is 
applicable to the athletic field. Is that correct? So, yes. So, yes. as we go on to the next portion, when we get into the other school projects, yeah. Sure. Um, well, I'll let Dr. Oshie speak. Okay. Um, that's going to be talked about a little bit more than the other school projects. But you're right, Mr. Mudge. It's, um, the athletic fields generally don't qualify for the reimbursements. Some of it, but not the bulk of it. Yes. Yes. So uh, I, don't, I don't have a fancy PowerPoint, everyone, but um, I do want to draw some attention. Uh, if you came in and missed some of these brochures, please, um, they, there are plenty of them in the back of the room if you want to get your hands on one. There are two colors, by the way. One is blue. That's just the uh, track and field. And the other one is uh, kind of a brownish color. And that one uh, gives some information about the remainder of the bond. So as Mr. Mudge was was asking about there is a reimbursement for the school side of, of this bonding. So we anticipate overall all the projects taken together um, that we would be looking in the neighborhood of $3 million in reimbursement to the school department uh, to cover the cost of our $13.5 million. So roughly in the neighborhood of 30 to 35 percent. But a lot of that does depend on the type of school related project. For instance, uh, an ADA compliance issue at an elementary school is definitely a high priority item for that reimbursement, whereas an athletic field may not get that kind of reimbursement money. So just to uh, give you a sense of the remaining items on this, um, we can start at the high school. Uh, one of the big money items on this bond, another in the neighborhood of $3 million, is second and third floor air conditioning. Um, we, as, as all of you know, any of the students here know all too well, uh, when you get to that, those early weeks of September or those weeks in June or late May, um, uh, you know, a 75 or 80 degree day outside can be a 90 to 100 degrees on that third floor. Um, the, this building was made with central air conditioning in mind uh, when it was being constructed, but it was an item that was pulled from that at the time um, because of you know, fiscal, you know, budgetary issues. And so um, it never really got to the point that it was a building that was ventilating well. Uh, we have done some things um, with uh, capital money that we've uh, set aside from our fund balance over the years, including trying to kind of blow the, the hot air out of that gap between the roof and the ceiling on the third floor. That's helped a little bit, but not nearly as much as it needs to. So. It's still um, a really difficult uh, learning environment when you get to those rough weeks of, you know. So we're looking at providing um, AC for the second and third floor classrooms and into the whole spine area. We've been advised that if we don't do that, a lot of that cold air is just going to come down to the spine anyway, and you won't get as much of an effect on the second and third floor. Uh, at the high school, you're also looking at a number of flooring needs. In, in fact, this, this rug in the... Uh, in the auditorium is, is a likely um, uh, item here, that pretty expensive item to, to replace. Um, various plumbing, mechanical, architectural projects around the building. Uh, if you look around the building, you can see some cracking in the flooring, uh, just in the, in the hallways. Those are things that we're going to have to rectify. They're all very important projects. They're all things that could turn into bigger problems down the road. Um, they're not as... Um, you know, exciting as, as synthetic turf and a new uh, track, but they are very important items nonetheless. Um, at Davisville and Wickford Middle School, there are also various plumbing, mechanical, and electrical projects, but Davisville Middle has windows, a need for windows at DMS. It, it, uh, a few years ago in the, in the last bond, back in 2012, we were able to fix the roof at Davisville Middle School. We never were able to address the windows, and those windows, I believe, are probably, if I think they're probably original to the building, which goes back many, many years. And um, anyone who has been through that building or who works in that building will tell you they are in vital need of repair, and um, this project um, would, this uh, bond would address those issues. At the elementary schools, again, a number of plumbing, mechanical, electrical, fire protection projects at all the schools is also, uh, a, when you put all these th together, a major component, another two to three million dollars of this bond goes to floor covering projects. Um, a lot, you know, you can imagine how important a, a rug is at an elementary school like Stony Lane or Quidnesset where 
you have you know an open classroom um, and all of the the building basically all of the learning areas are carpeted um, a few years back when we had a lot of water entering the building at Quidneset we fixed that roof but and we also put down a new carpet that we really really like it is a mold resistant product um, and it, it feels like a carpet looks like a carpet but it really cleans up um, in a, in a nice way where you can even like write with a sharpie on this carpet and things will come right up and uh, it's, it's really served Quidnesset well so we would like to get the same type of product in the open classroom areas at Stony Lane and at Fishing Cove in particular and those uh, just just replacing the carpeting at Stony Lane all by itself is about a seven hundred thousand dollar project this is not uh, cheap when you're looking at that huge a project and it's also a time-consuming project when we did this at Quidnesset that project alone took the entire summer and we were really sweating it out on Labor Day weekend to make sure that we opened school on time on the following Tuesday because it, it, you have to basically remove all of the learning equipment out of every classroom, put down the surfacing, put down the carpet, and bring everything back in. So it can be a long, long process um, and an expensive one. And there are also some HVAC projects at uh, Quidnesset and, and Hamilton that are included in, in all of this. At Davisville Academy, there's some emergency lighting. At the D building offices over here where we house our technology, maintenance, transportation um, offices, there are also some floor covering and some window issues that we need to address. We talked about the athletic complex. Um, the athletic complex, particularly with the new track, um, would allow us to start hosting meets again for the track. We would, uh, we would not have a track eligible for a state meet, but that's a very special event but we would be able to do just about every other interscholastic kind of meet uh, that exists out there. So we'd be very happy with that. Um, the, presenting the track for a state meet, um, it, it is an option that will be presented to the school committee, but so far in the preliminary discussions, we found that to be um, a lot more expensive and would probably exceed the $3 million that we've set aside for this work. So, you know, there is um, a great deal in this for all of our schools. Uh, a lot of the projects, even though, you know, you mentioned something like plumbing, it doesn't sound very exciting, but trust me, it is something that is, is a high priority. In fact, it's not just, you know, Phil Auger's priority that's presented to the school committee. This is something where we have architectural firms work with us. They, they put together a comprehensive list of all of the projects in the district um, that are going to need to be addressed in the next 20 years. And that, that list alone comes up to about 70 million dollars in projects and through a process that includes them that includes ride that includes the administration and the school committee we get to a point where we prioritize those items that need to be handled first and that's how we got to this 13 and a half million and I'm going to invite Mr. Mollis up here right now and I guess we can take questions together Mr. Mollis and I once he's done but um, I, I know he has some comments about you know, the funding piece of all this, the, the town um, projects involved. And um, so I think they're kind of relevant and kind of dovetail together. So, Mr. Mollis, thank you for coming tonight. Thank you, Superintendent. <coughs> so, um, <coughs> excuse me. So first, I want to thank you for taking the time to be here this evening. I mean, this is a very important question for North Kingstown, and I know that we're here to answer your questions. So uh, thank you for taking the time. This is an important time in North Kingstown. Uh, what you have in front of you on question four from November 6th was something that was well thought out. I just want to recognize a couple of council people who are here, and I'm just looking around to make sure I'm not missing anyone. Our council president, Dick Welch, is here, and Councilman Kevin Maloney. Uh, obviously, they were part of the council that put this proposal together. And I will say, from where I'm sitting, this is a very exciting time in North Kingstown. I'm going to talk a little bit about the town side of the bond, and I'm also going to talk about the funding portion of it. But I have to say that we are just as excited on the school department side. There are a lot of exciting things happening at the athletic field, in the various schools. And as all of you know, and I don't have to tell you this, People are coming to this town for a lot of different reasons, but one of them is because of our outstanding school system. And we have to provide facilities that meet that reputation that are second to none. And so this is a long time coming, and I'm going to explain how this really is the most opportune time for this town to move forward on this project. Now, 
I was trying to think on the write-up how I can explain uh, how an, of an opportune time it is. Because what we've been telling everyone is that with our low interest rates, with our high rating, with the great financial condition the town is in, with the fact that we're retiring our debt, something we keep calling a debt cliff, um, that this is a time where we can do all these projects and not have any additional impact on the operating budget or the tax rate. And we have a slide presentation on our website, which I'll turn to you on in a few minutes, just letting you know where you can get this. But in reality, what does that mean? So we have a debt cliff, we have a high rating. How really is this the right time for North Kingstown to tackle these one-time projects? The best way I can explain it is that if, if I owned a home and I had a 20-year mortgage and I'm now in my 20th year and I have as much in savings as I've ever had, my credit rating my, is as high as it's ever been, and I have needs that I have to make in my home to bring the home back to the level that it really needs to be at. And the interest rates are low, so I decide to go with a home equity. And what I've, what I've done is I have the savings, so I'm in solid financial shape. Interest rates are low. I'm getting even lower rate because my credit is so high. And I've, I know I can afford this because I'm erasing a $1,500 a month on bill and erasing my mortgage, but adding it with an equity. That's what we're doing here in North Kingstown. We are very fortunate that right now we are going through a time where we're going to be erasing most of our debt. And I'll run some numbers by you just so you can get a feel as to what we're looking at. But because we're erasing our debt, it's called a debt cliff. And so our payments and our principal and interest payments that we're paying every single year in our budget are going to start going like this. And we're going to use that space in the middle to fund these important projects. Now, you would never bond operating expenses. You would never bond salaries. You would never bond maintenance. What we bond is we bond these one-time expenses. And that way we can get us to a level point, a strong base, and then begin maintaining those assets. So for a couple of examples, almost all of the town's debt, every single dime that we have, will be eliminated by 2033. The most significant part of that debt, Cliff, where we're going to really see the greatest savings, is from 2018 to 2027. So over these next eight to nine years, almost all of our debt is going to be erased. And so as a result, our principal and interest payments are going to dramatically decline, and we have some room to make some improvements to both our school infrastructure and our town infrastructure. Ironically, even with this new debt, with this new general obligation bond, <clears throat> because of the position that we're in, we're actually going to begin a second debt cliff in 2023. So even though we're going out for this $27 million bond, if it was approved, and we began doing all these projects right away, seven, six years from now, five years from now, our principal and interest payments are actually going to start declining again because we're erasing more and more debt in years 2023 to 2033. So the bottom line is that this is just an opportune time financially for the town to tackle a lot of projects that, in a lot of our opinions, have been long overdue, have been put aside because we don't want to impact the tax rate, have been put aside because we don't want to impact the budget. And then once we get to that point, we can then begin maintaining these facilities. And I'll explain in a couple of minutes how in our budget there are, there are maintenance line items to begin doing that. So we won't have to face this again five, ten years from now. Before I talk about exactly what the town's portion is in the bond, I do want to say a couple of things. Also at the front of the room, there's a very simple handout explaining exactly what the town's portion of the bond is, explaining this whole debt cliff that I just talked about, and also talking about part of the school department bond. And so it just gives you a, a glimpse of exactly what
One, well, as a matter of fact, before I talk about that, I do want to explain that the $13.5 million bond, so when you pass that, if you pass that, it can only be spent under these different categories. However, it doesn't have to be spent under the, these different categories. What I mean by that is that if we have $1.7 million for the mandated closure of the town landfills, if it comes in at 1.4, we don't have to spend the 1.7. In addition, if we get a grant that allows us to close the landfills, we don't have to pay the 1.7. So that's why when I talk about the bond, I always say you're authorizing us to spend up to $13.5 million. We have to spend within these categories, but it's not necessarily money that will be spent. In addition, every single dime that's spent has to be authorized by the town council at a public meeting. So while you're authorizing the expenditures on November 6th, hopefully, throughout the year, when the council will decide how we're spending it via bids and whatnot, you can attend those meetings and also let your voice be heard. So the 13.5 is 1.8 million for the paving of much needed roads that we consider in poor condition. Years ago, the town hired a consultant. This consultant went throughout the town and highlighted those roads that are in poor condition. We, we maintain that list and we continue to update it. Last year and this year, the last two, these most recent two budgets, we now, with the council's leadership, allocate $750,000 a year for paving. However, that 750 will net, never get us caught up. So if we have this 1.8 million plus $750,000 a year that we already have in that budget, by doing that we will be able to capture all of our poor roads and begin a routine maintenance so that way roads don't get poor, that we actually can start paving roads that are in fair condition. And so this is a pretty important allocation. There's 1.7 million for the closure of the, the state mandated closure of our town landfills. We have two landfills that require a lot of financial resources to close. Not only is that good environmentally, not only is that good for our community, but it also opens the door for potential uh, revenue generators. Uh, if the town decides, if you decide that we want to put renewable energy on these landfills, we can begin doing so, but we can't do anything on these landfills until they are properly closed. We have $800,000 to renovate and, and improve the Wilson Park field and the town beach campus. And so that money is to reconstruct the Wilson Park field. We have brand new fields in Quonset now so we can close the field, not have an effect on our programs, and then bring that field back up to the condition that North Kingstown deserves. And in addition, 300000 for our town beach campus. Uh, we're in dire need of a new facility there, a new building there, restroom, possible concession, and so that would go towards that. We have $5 million towards the renovation and restoration of town hall. That could be seed money. That could be a complete restoration. That will be decided in a public meeting, a public hearings with the council. If we decide to make it some sort of a community building with a council chamber, then that $5 million is actually more than enough, and there will be money left over. If we decide to bring town hall back to that building, then this is seed money towards that. If we decide not to do nothing, and hopefully that's not the case, then this money will just not be spent. It will not be borrowed. And so what that means is that when, if you don't borrow it, then the principal and interest payment is actually less than what you'll see when you look at our debt schedule online. And then finally, there is $4 million for capital improvements to our town facilities. This is a well thought out, very, very um, integrated plan to cover a lot of buildings, from boilers to ADA um, improvements. There's just a lot in this plan. I do want to just cover a couple of it, a couple of items. But when you go online, attached to that spreadsheet, attached to that PowerPoint, is a spreadsheet explaining exactly where all this money is dedicated to go. Again, all this will happen in a public hearing. So we're looking at upgrades, ADA improvements, HVAC improvements, building and roof improvements, landscaping, equipment and other improvements to our public safety buildings, our parks and playgrounds, our library, our senior center, our community center, our cl golf clubhouse and maintenance facility, our DPW facility, the Wickford restrooms in the municipal office building. So when you go through that spreadsheet, you'll see all of these buildings there and all the different items that we're looking to tackle with this $4 million. Uh, that's, three, I believe, 13.3, and we have a couple of hundred thousand in there for contingency. So, so that's where the town money is allocated or hopefully will be spent. Um, again, that's a, a real brief synopsis of this 13.5, why we think it's the right time, how the money is going to be spent, in the postcard that we're sending, in the ad that's there, 
in online and encourages you to email me with any questions that you may have. So, of course, this evening, feel free to ask them. But after tonight, if you think of one, if you have a friend or a family member who has one, send us an email and I can assure you we will do our best to get that information to you in the most accurate and efficient manner possible. And um, the superintendent and I are answer, here to answer any questions. Yeah, I just want to add that the school department also on our website has uh, an FAQ. So we, we anticipate certain kinds of questions. They also include comments from Mr. Mollis about the town end of things. So it's also a good place to, to get information or to share that with other people if you so choose. So I don't know if there are any questions or comments. That so again, if, I'd open it up if you have a again. question. If you could come to the microphone, please state your name and address. And the question on the second portion of the presentation. My name is Ron Wheaton. I live at 145 Terramont Drive in North Kingston. A um, couple of things. One was in regards to the debt, Mr. Munch has mentioned how the, the longevity of some of these projects are shorter than the, the uh, bond itself. And then as an example with the deal, having a, long, a lifespan of maybe 10, 12 years, I, I think it was suggested, and then some of the maintenance will be increasing. And the bond was still paying for 20 years. Well, that's when we'll also have to be probably taking out new bonds in order to extend the life of, the, of some of these projects, whether it's air conditioning or fields or whatever it is. The other concern, I, I, you may have answered my question, Mr. Mollison, thank you, but I want to elaborate on it, is what assurances do we have that you mentioned these things can only be used for specific categories? Uh, are there provisions in the bond or any of the legalities that give us those guarantees and assurances that they can't be used for other things that are not infrastructure or facility re, re, you know, improvements. So I'll, um, I'll answer both questions. The first question uh, regarding the lifespan of the of what we're purchasing or building compared to the 20 year lifespan of the, of the debt. And that's an excellent question. And I just want to let you know that our plan, and I know the school department's plan is to build that into our operating budgets for maintenance. So for example, a lot of the things you see are items that, that we need to address or should have addressed in the past through no one's fault because we're trying to keep the tax rate low. What we would do is we would now budget for the paving of the road so we never have to ask for that 1.8 million. The landfill will be complete. The improvements we're making to the public buildings are, are improvements that we should be budgeting every single year under a capital budget, which now we do every single year within our budget. So a lot of these things we can forecast, I personally don't see the town having the need to go out for a bond for these items. You never know what the future holds. However, if we ever did, the good thing is that, as I mentioned, we're experiencing a debt cliff again in 2023. But again, that would not, I would hope that would not be our plans uh, in the future. As far as the allocation of the funds, that is state law. So that's why I said you'll see an ad in the local newspaper that's very, it's not helpful at all. But state law requires us to do that because that is the town and the school department's commitment as to how we're spending the money. So the answer is yes, our hands are tied. So you see us putting as much as we can in that ad in order to ensure that we don't tie our hands as far as what we can, what we can allocate the money for. But again, please know that state law is very clear. When we say $4 million for town facilities and these are the facilities, this is what we want to do, we have to spend $4 million on those facilities. We can't decide to do something else with it, buy, um, you know, buy apparatus or whatnot. So the answer is yes, we are, our hands are tied in the most general of terms to what the bond is. I'd also like to add, you pointed out the athletic field and the, and the, um, the track. The, the last track that we had had a life of about nine years and then we could not use it anymore. And the problem there was that there wasn't a plan, there wasn't a long-term maintenance plan to, to see that through, to resurface it, and to get another, say, nine or 10 years out of it. Um, so all of these things have a lifespan, and you can, you can extend them by maintaining it properly. And, and I, I'm not looking to blame anyone in the past about any of these issues. I think it's more important to learn from those projects. So um, I'm, I'm delighted that, you know, the plan that we have has, uh, you know, the, the better, synthetic turf is actually a money saver in the long term. And it's going to be not only the job of this school committee and, and myself, but our, our, the people who follow us in, in the years out to, um, to you know, learn from these issues, to find that the savings that we have that from what we're spending now to what we will be spending then, that we should be 
setting that money aside as best we can and having a, an actual capital plan that has this kind of major maintenance project. Uh, the, you know, our capital, our, our, our regular operating budget, as Mr. Mollis pointed out, you know, hires teachers and pays for health care and puts the heat and the buses and all that sort of thing. That's a year to year budgeting. But these items do come up once in a while. You know, once every 20 years is probably a pretty good life, you know, to, to you know, I, hopefully we don't have to think about replacing these projects before 20 years out. It's going to be, there's going to be maintenance and it's going to be expensive, but we have to plan for that. You're right. Thank you. Next. Oh. Yep, you're up. <laughs> uh, Keith McCall, Lazarski, 673 Tower Hill Road. I have a question more for the prospective potential new middle school and the athletic field. And because I know that the high school grounds are considered, are being considered for potentially yes. the new middle school. So I'm wondering if the potential changes to the athletic field, would the plans potentially for the new middle school kind of interrupt that athletic field area? Yeah. Or would that be a completely different issue mm -hmm. in space? Okay, that, that's, a, that's a good question. So in, in this past year, there have been some public sessions where the school committee has talked about, you know, where do we want to be in 20 years with our schools? And one of the ideas floated out there includes the building of a new middle school um, for uh, but principally because of Wickford Middle. Wickford Middle is a beautiful old building. I love being in there, and it's a great school. But the building has served its useful life. It was built in the 1930s. If you tried to make that a brand new school building today, it would not pass code for a whole bunch of reasons. So it really, and, and when you try to maintain it, uh, the costs of maintenance escalate uh, incredibly because, you know, uh, because if you want to, say, drill through a wall, now you have to look at an asbestos issue that, uh, for, you know, remediation for that. That adds a lot of costs. So think about that old clunker car that you're, you're tired of putting hundreds and thousands of dollars into to maintain it, and it gets to a point where getting a new model um, would actually be cheaper. So there is an idea out there with the intent of having a new middle school in North Kingstown, preferably one that could service all of our middle school students, and then possibly uh, with um, working with all of the other buildings, get to a point where we have six schools in North Kingstown and not eight. So we would have four elementary schools, one middle school, and one high school. Um, this property has been uh, thrown out there as an idea, and we've had our architects talk to us about the possibility of that. I've also looked at the Wickford property, neither of which are absolutely ideal just because of space. You could see with the maps that we had um, at the pre on the previous um, presentation that this property is surrounded by wetlands. So it's not like you can just kind of build out. Um, so those ideas are really preliminary right now. Um, and there's going to be a lot of people who are going to weigh in on them before that gets presented to be a bond at some later date. Um, I, I would intend, uh, as a uh, superintendent, and I know members of the school committee are interested in starting to have that conversation after this bond is done, um, because we, we are worried about, you know, focusing year to year on what's going to be a budget and what are the schools going to look like as of next July 1, where we really need to start asking the question, where do we want to be in 10 years from now and 20 years from now, and what do the schools look like, and how modern are they, and how efficient are they, and you know, do they help us solve other problems like, like bus st uh, school start times and that sort of thing. So that is in play. That being said, um, this project with the field, for instance, right now we intend to have for a lot greater high school use. We also intend to include uh, more middle school action on these fields. Um, so that would happen regardless of what we do with a new school. Um, and we also intend to include community usage. So, you know, we, the, the items in this bond, um, you know, focusing, say, like on Davisville Middle School windows and on the high school, those are two buildings that we know, no matter what the scenario, no one has talked about the closure of those two buildings. So we really want to, you know, enhance what we know we're going to have for the long term. Um, even if it were decided today that we're going to build a new middle school somewhere near the high school, my guess is no one would be in that school until seven to ten years from now. 
So, you know, I think we have to kind of answer those questions down the line. Like, how does that work if there's a middle school in this area? And, and I, I think the, the answer is, to some extent, that middle school is going to have playing time on that field, but it probably won't be their only field, just like it's, it's not now, you know. And, and there's going to be, and it's going to be one of dozens of questions about how we share resources amongst the whole district, middle and high school included. So I don't know if I, that fully answered your question. Yeah, but I just want to make sure we're getting like, so many good years of use of that, especially that practice area. That's probably the biggest. Right, right. So we're getting so many years of good use of that money. Yeah, I think that no matter what happens, um, that we're looking at many good years of uh, out of all of these projects. Absolutely. And, and by the way, it's one of the reasons why, you know, there's, there's a lot of, of funding here in this 13 and a half million that goes to Davisville Middle, but not so much that goes for Wickford Middle, because we do have some really tough questions to ask about Wickford Middle going forward. So we didn't want to put a lot of money into that building just to have a conversation months or a, a year or two from now about, you know, closing. You know, so, yeah, but that was considered. Thank you. Next, sir. Gary Leonard, 235 Essex Road. I spoke to the school committee about two years ago about the deplorable condition of the high school track. At that time, I had grandchildren running, and I feared for damage to their legs, their ankles. My daughter coaches a field hockey team. You cannot play field hockey on that field that we have now after a football game really require a smooth surface for field hockey. But I want to go back into history. When the stadium was built, North Kingstown had the opportunity to be the first school in the state to put artificial turf in. And at that point, I was against it. I was not on the school committee at that time, but I had served in this school committee. But when they put that turf in, they also said they would maintain it. And they hired someone specifically to maintain that field. And when the cost of that maintenance reached close to $100,000 a year for the person and the materials, it was dropped. And it was going to be maintained by the regular school department personnel. You need the artificial turret. Even if it's only got a 10-year life, it's going to be cheaper than that 100,000, and that was back quite a few years ago, to maintain that deal. I do urge everyone to vote for this. But I have one question that's been bothering me, because I've had school committee people say this to me, and town count people running for council. They say it's a conflict of interest to come out and say they support it, or they want it. I can understand that, the superintendent, the teachers, that would be a conflict. They're coming out and saying, look, pass that bond issue, pass that bond issue. But the elected officials, I don't think it's a conflict. I think it's your job to say, I like this issue. Go for it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> Mr. Jones wanted to just briefly respond to. <laughs> yeah, a couple points you raised. Um, one, I, I think when this committee, um, although not everyone was on it, but the committee that voted to send the bond forward, um, to me, a yes vote meant I supported the project. Um, so I would not have voted yes if I didn't think the taxpayers and the citizens of this town should also support it. Um, I think you raised a couple points, though. One on the track, and you know, we apologize for the few years that the track has been, and before that, I know the issue on the tennis courts, too. Um, but if we had fixed the track two years ago, you would see the issue now. We would have to rip it up to put in this turf field if it gets approved. Um, so sometimes there is some prudence um, in waiting to see the bigger picture come out, even though for a period of time, I know our, our student athletes and others had to suffer with substandard uh, situation there. And the other point, I think, again, to highlight what was uh, in the presentation. So for at least the first eight years that the field is under warranty, um, not only do we have local maintenance with the equipment and other stuff in place, but we do get the annual maintenance from whoever the contractor is that 
um, we decide should the bond be approved. So um, I agree that that keeps, you know, built in, baked into some of this is that that maintenance for that. Thank you. Next. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Short person. Um, Renee Reese, 17 Lindley Avenue. My question about the bond is um, I noticed that the windows are on there and the windows would be considered somewhat of a security um, type of solution. And I just wasn't sure if there are any other um, security things that you're adding that would be in, like, say, the advertisement that aren't in the brochure. The, the, um, the projects in this bond do not include much in terms of security. But I do want you to know that this school committee has voted for hundreds of thousands of dollars towards security projects o just over the last few years, including this year. So, um, in fact, um, on that very issue, uh, Mr. Mollis will be back here and we'll have the same setup two weeks from tonight, in fact, on, on November 30th. And we will have representatives from the North Kingstown Police Department and, and the Fire Department to talk. So we're going to have kind of a special open discussion about security in the district. But um, there has been investment. Uh, I know that the school committee has it as a regular goal of theirs to continue to look at security for increases, and um, and uh, you know that I, I anticipate that will continue, and we'll have a lot more detail on that for you two weeks from tonight. Yeah. Okay, and I um, just have a follow-up to that. Sure. I won't be able to make it that night, but I um, some school districts have, and you don't have to say whether or not this is something you would consider or whether you have it. This being in um, school administration as well. But um, we in Terre Haute and um, actually um, in some districts, I'll just say that there are panic buttons. Um, the school secretary has them and the um, principal's office has them. And I don't know if that's something that we have or that you'd consider, but that's something that I just wanted to share. It, Thank you. It has been discussed as part of the plan, yes. Thank you. Uh, next, if you want to speak, sir, if you could come a little closer to the mic. Um, And Mr. Mudge, I'll let you go next. Uh, just uh, last two or three months, we lost a senator, Republican Senator John Kane. I can see him now going like this to a vote in front of Congress. He was a hero of our, our country who stood up for his country. He was a prisoner of war and did what he thought was right for this country. In his final practical words, because he died shortly thereafter, he went down, I'm not voting for this. And the reason he did that was because of process. Process, process, process. His colleagues didn't go through a fair and a, and a substantive technical review of what he felt needed to be done. So I'd like to bring the attention, the community and yourself to this. I'm disappointed in the process of this bond. Okay? Mr. Munch, I don't mean to interrupt you, but it, is there a question? I do have a citizen's comments portion well, that yeah, is more for a dialogue. This is relevant. I is it think. a question, though, sir? Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah. if you could get to the but, question, and I, later well, after the question and answer, you okay. can give a speech okay. or, or First, like discuss. First, let's town, uh, The town uh, charter, the purpose of the Asset Management Commission shall be to review all capital improvement and asset protection requests related to the town and school facilities, establish their priorities, and determine the levels and formulate a co comprehensive capital improvement program and an asset plan to be presented to the town council. Why didn't the school committee and the administration submit their bond proposal to the Asset Management Commission for their review? Number one. Number two is on June, uh, excuse me, January 16th, I believe, or 18th, the town manager at a asset management commission meeting said, we don't need your help. Okay? We don't need your help. The town charter says the asset management commission will do such and such. The town manager again come back and said, we don't need your help. The town manager Two weeks after that, certified the submittal of the bond request to the Department of Education, which is illegal and not in conformance 
but the regulations set forth in the necessity of construction. I want to know why we didn't consider that. Why weren't they a part of that? And when will the Asset Management Commission provide guidance and direction on this proposal? There are many problems with this proposal. You'll notice in the proposal we have $2,800 or $2,600 for a bond to support high wash stations in schools. What are we waiting for? We don't need a bond to do that. We haven't looked at this bond and said, what's the most efficient way to fund some of these projects? For example, the bonds that are going to be proposed are going to cost the town probably because of interest and for many other reasons, much more than you're anticipating. It, the town bonds will be costing us 40% roughly in a, an interest. The school committee, the town's interest is for their projects. Why aren't we looking at the ways we need to, what we need to do and to do it fairly? I said some 10 or 15 years ago, many times, which both the town council ignored on many, many occasions, and the school committee, that we did not have air conditioning in this building classrooms. Classrooms, okay? Classrooms. Nobody looked at it. Two years ago, we spent a million. Mr. Mudge, you're, you're seven hundred thousand dollars. Well, I heard some questions in there, but okay, I'm not hearing. To answer your question, Mr. Boss. Right. But well, let me finish though. We spent one point seven million dollars. That never went through the Asset Management Commission. Town Council just signed off on it, let it go. Nobody looked at it to validate it. It was. If you look up the record, you'll say, that was supposed to fix the problem at the high school. Yes. Okay? No, it didn't. You know what it did? That bond? It put air conditioning in the, or excuse me, heat in the first floor administrative offices. This building was built without any air conditioning for classrooms, but it was built with air conditioning for the administrative offices. What's wrong with that? Well. We look at it. We spent thousands of dollars a Again, year. Mr. Mudge, you teaches, haven't, you've asked questions, but you haven't let anyone okay. answer them. I'll just finish and I'll continue question, on. Bill, we spent okay. thousands of dollars, okay, on electricity for years. Nobody listened, okay? The poor teachers were, and the students were going through hell with the heat. You know what we had in the administrative areas that nobody wanted to address? They had air conditioning, but you know what they didn't have? They didn't have any heat, the administrative offices. What kind of process did we go you're through? You're still not allowing us to answer okay, any questions. Okay, But I still have a couple other ones here. So, so uh, uh, yeah, uh, we'll, we'll answer the questions well, you have. Well, yeah, but I'm, I'm concerned well, about the integrity of this process. Why didn't the asset management? Commission? I understand, Mr. Mudge. So that's we perfect. Had an that, so that's that's perfect. Without, and, and please, um, I'm here to we're here to help it. That is the first question I've heard. So I'm going to be look forward to answer that question. Um, throughout the dialogue, you, re, you concluded with a question, why didn't the Asset Management Commission weigh in? And I want to answer that question. Um, first, you had mentioned that I had attended a meeting and said we don't need your help. I just really want to clarify, I can assure you, minutes, recordings, whatever we can find, those words never came out of my mouth. You can because I can, I can tell you, that the Asset Management Commission is well aware to a person that we absolutely need their help. They are a viable part of this community. If they review well, this pro pro Mr. program? Mr. Mudge, please. So what their, question, what, their, what their job is, and I believe they'll tell you that, um, actually we're working with them right now in the entire budgetary process. I don't want to bore everyone, not bore, I don't want to, I don't want to use this dialogue to explain how the Asset Management Commission works, but their job, according to Charter, is advisory. They put months and months and months of work of meeting with department heads and put together a capital improvement plan that is this thick. And they give it to the council and they give it to the town and then we use that to formulate our budget and all future needs. I can assure you that if you look at that capital improvement plan, spend a couple of hours, go through that plan and then compare it to the bond, you will see that their message, although advisory, was heard loud and clear. This bond addresses a lot of the items 
that they put in the capital improvement plan. The capital improvement plan is listing all of the needs of the community, explaining those needs, and then isolating funding sources, general fund, grants, bond, state aid, et cetera. We've taken those needs, we've utilized the funding source of a bond, and we've addressed them. So I, with all due respect to the Asset Management Commission, there they did a lot of work to help us put this together. That's exactly so, correct. And so at, once they do that, we then don't go to them and ask them to review it. At that point, our job as departments are to put together what we think is best for the community, to put it to the council in a public hearing, and it's the council's job to decide what happens from there. And they did just that. And they've had, they, they hire us to do a lot of that legwork, provide them with a program, and that's what we've done. So to answer the question, to go all the way back to the, the final question, why wasn't the Asset Management Commission involved? I can assure you they were. And I think if you ask the chair, Mr. Cooney, that we, are, we have an exceptional relationship with them. They're working on the fiscal year 20 budget with us, and we'll be utilizing the information to put forth the fiscal year 20 I budget. think that's very dishonest of you to say that. And we'll look it all up. We'll ask the Mr. Mudge, Asset Mr. Management Mudge, Commission about that. I, I mentioned if you want to have okay. a, a citizen's comments, I'll give you three minutes like anyone else at citizen's comments to, to say whatever you'd like. But again, you know, you've taken up a lot of time, and we've answered well, the question that you presented. Talk, reflect upon the position. But I will say, and not to interrupt need, you, but I will say that, you know, we, we can disagree, and I respect that, and that's what we're here. But I can assure you, to use the words dishonest just doesn't fall very it, uh, kindly. I would ask you to... disingenuous I, I would ask you to join okay. me in attending an Asset Management Commission, and I can assure you, to the person, they'll all disagree with you on that. The Asset Management Commission... Thank you, Mr. No Mudge. Idea there are other what's people waiting to comment, Mr. Mudge. Okay. Please. Again, other people Dr. waiting to comment. Just trying to just, you know... Same old thing. Let's Thank you, Mr. Mudge. Thank you. Let's not look at what's really going on here. Okay? For example. Mr. Mudge, your, your time is up. If you could please right, sit down. Go. Just let you know, I Mr. submitted Mudge. information to the Department of Education and Mr. Mudge, on please. bond fraud please sit down, related Mudge. to these projects. Bond fraud. And I gave it to you, Mr. Chairman, and you did never return me, uh, you never returned Mr. a Mudge. call to me. Bond fraud. Would you please sit? Thank you. Next person, please. Thank you. Uh, good, good evening. My name is uh, Gerald Browning. I live at 26 Charles Street in North Kingstown. I presently have two children here at the high school. Both of them will be running track. Uh, well, one has been running track for three years, and the other will be joining the track team uh, this winter. If, I, if you would indulge me just for a minute, I'd like to give you a little background. Uh, my wife and I moved to North Kingstown in 2003. Uh, and uh, prior to that, I was uh, a high school teacher at Robert E. Fitch Senior High School in Groton, Connecticut. I started teaching and coaching in 1971. Well, that's a long time ago, and some of my memory is a little bit short here. But I remember coaching track, and we had, in 1971, we had a synthetic track, one of the first in Connecticut. And I can re remember my, my athletic director saying to me one day, it's a beautiful track, and as long as we take care of it, it will last a long time. So in Groton, we had a maintenance program on the track every four to five years. They'd come in, and, and as the superintendent was saying, they would replace the carpet. And every four to five years, they fix the carpet on that track. Today, well, figure it out, 1971, 2018, I don't know, 40 years, 45 years? Today, the track, if you want to go look at it in Groton, the track is still operating, kids are still using it, and uh, all because they had a good maintenance plan. I think that's crucial to whatever you do with the track and the football field, is to make sure that you have a maintenance facility. When I first came here, when I first saw the track, I was, I was appalled. Why, why can't we use the track? And I started coaching here four years ago as a volunteer assistant women's track coach. And I used to say to Jen Chabot, who I, I love dearly, the women's track coach, I'd say, why, why don't they just fix it? You know, why wasn't it fixed? And, and it was, again, I'm not trying to place blame, but I'm just saying that 
you know, it was, it was just terrible that we couldn't. We have on the indoor team coming up this year, we, we will have close to 90 girls running. And we will have almost that same 90 outdoor. You're talking about 180 kids. Almost 10% of your school population will be using that track this year. And that's just for, that's just for girls track. That's not boys track. That's not the middle school. And I, I hate and to interrupt you. I did the same for Mr. Mudge, so it's only no, fair. That's, that's if fine. there's a question, so, so otherwise you can no, speak I, later. I'm just yeah. speaking in favor. I, okay. I have an ulterior motive. I'm a track <laughs> coach. And my, and my kids are, my kids are here. Uh, and I don't get any money for coaching. I do it on a volunteer basis. And I just think this is a, uh, uh, as that fine gentleman said, this is a wonderful opportunity uh, to help our town and to help our kids too, because frankly, we do train on it, we run on it, and we're constantly, constantly being beset by shin splints. By, I mean, that track is like running on pavement. And uh, so that's all I have to say. I, I hope that, uh, I don't want to use, too, use up too much of your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I don't mean to, I just want to make sure everyone's clear. Right after the question and answer portion, we will have our usual citizens comments in which we'll allow anybody who wants to speak for up to three minutes. If you want to have a comment you know, for or against the project in general, that would be the time to speak. Um, this is more for questions right now. So um, if you could speak, uh, name and address uh, and your question. Thanks. Uh, my name is Kara Martone. I live at 73 Woodridge Drive. Uh, my question is about if you could just explain a little bit about the cash flow with the bond um, in terms of it does the whole 25 million come in at once? If you don't spend it all, what happens to that money? That's, that's a, that's a, thank you. Thank you. That's a very good question. So the way we've developed the spreadsheet is assuming immediate receipt of the bond proceeds. And so what I mean by that is that's a, what you see here is a worst case scenario. Worst case scenario means we'll be spending all the money relatively soon within that first year. However, the answer to the question is, we would only issue the bonds as we need the money. And so, for example, just last month, the council um, de-issued, de-authorized a bond that was approved by the town 10 years ago. And so, so let's say the bond was for 10 million and they only spent 9.1. They, they, they de-issued the authorization to spend that extra 900,000. My point is that if the bids come in lower, um, if the projects don't unapproved by the council, if we decide we don't want to go that route, then we may only issue 23, uh, well, we wanted, we only issue 23 million or 24 million. In addition, as far as cash flow, what, we, what the town would do, well, so let's say we know we want to have a large project is that we're going to spend 25 million in the first year, first two years, but it'll be every three months we're doing something different. We'll issue what's called bands, bond anticipation notes. And so the short term notes, and then we would then roll over those bands into the final bond and then just have one issuance. The reason why you do that is there's a cost of issuance. So when you finally do issue the bond, there is money that the town and the school has to spend to issue those bonds, the underwriters, the cost of issuance, et cetera. And so what you want to do is you want to have one issuance if possible because what would happen is if you did 25 million, let's say, and then three years from now we want to do the extra two, the cost of issuance on the two just doesn't make sense so you're better off trying to get as much done as you can and finance it with bands. Again, that's you know, very, really getting into the weeds there, and I'll actually rely on our financial advisor and our, my finance director who understands that a lot better than I do, but I do know just by municipal experiences and finance experience that um, I I've, I've, have experience in projects this large, and that's exactly how we would do that. So that's, that's a great question. Um, cash flow would be handled via the need of the bond, and we could anticipate a lot of that with bands because we want to reduce the, the times that we actually have an issuance, um, for lack of a better word. Just uh, to add very briefly to that point, for the school projects, um, as was already indicated tonight, um, there is a timeline in place uh, pending the approval of uh, this bond that um, we would be doing the installation of the track and field uh, this upcoming summer. Not all of the projects would take place this upcoming summer. Um, you know, particularly, you know, the high school air conditioning, the windows, those are projects that probably would take more than one summer to complete. So, but
but a as we need the funding to take care of those, that's when we would start to um, go into, you know, debt buffering. So. And I believe one, la one last point. I'm not sure if it's in the ad. It's something that we just approved. It's either in the ad or the actual um, backup to the bond. But in the backup, and if you need that, we can send it, it shows each project in when the town of school intends on tackling that project, how long will it take to tackle it, and what's the lifespan of the project. Thank you. Next, sir. Hi, Jeff Land, 23 Sedgefield. Uh, and I have a daughter on the field hockey team. So my question is, I think you mentioned it'll be ready at the end of next summer. Yes. How quickly will you be able to get started? And because field hockey practice starts in August. Well, uh, anyone, right, anyone who's ever dealt with a construction project knows not to be too optimistic. So um, we have uh, talked with uh, our athletic director, Coach Fassa, and, um, you know, we're going to be planning uh, to make sure we don't have too many home games uh, right up front next fall, just in case we need a little extra time. Um, but uh, we're doing everything we can with already, you know, kind of putting the groundwork in place and our very first meeting after uh, the bond referendum takes place, again, if things turn out positive, the school committee will be making decisions right then and there about, you know, what are the details on the infill and, and you know, all of the pieces that go into the project. They'll be giving that approval because we have to go out to bid to get a good um, contractor and that has to take place over the winter because they're planning for their summer and then everything has to be you know, ordered and, and ready to go at the earliest possible date this spring. Uh, it may even begin, you know, before school ends, uh, just because we really want to be ready to go September 1 to be able to play on that field. Practices, unfortunately, will probably, summer practices will probably be taking place off of that until, you know, ob obviously until we know everything is ready to go. But that's, that's the timeline, and, and we're already uh, aggressively working toward it. Next question, anyone? Richard Welch, uh, 8 Arrow Lane, North Kingstown. I just want to clear up a couple of things. Having served three and a half years on the high school building committee, before we built this building, back in the late 90s, um, the building committee, asset management, uh, and I believe the school committee at the time wanted to put the artificial turf in. The building committee for the town was the then sitting town council, and they alone decided to go with the turf. So it's, it wasn't the school committee that didn't do their job, and it wasn't for the support that the community gave to the new high school for the athletic. Uh, we understood the advantages of the synthetic, but the then sitting town council made that decision. And I only say that, I want to clarify it, <clears throat> that here we are almost 20 years later uh, trying to do the right thing. And uh, the second part of what I want to say, I want to correct something. It's not a conflict of interest for the elected officials to support the bond issue. Not at all. And if you look at the votes for both the town council and the school committee, you'll see uh, that's the reason we're here, is because there is support for the bond issue. The only place there is a conflict is in the state law, which says that the town itself cannot promote the indebtedness of the town. So they can give you facts, but they can't advertise. Uh, and I, want, I would like you to correct me on this, uh, Ralph, and, and just clarify that. But the issue is not that the candidates or the sitting elected officials cannot support it, that's wrong. And we have already done that by virtue of our votes. And that's why we're here tonight. Thank you. And that, that, just, that, is, that is exactly right. So as elected officials, as appointed officials, you know, we have every right to um, tell you what we think is good for the community and, and the decision rests in your hands. However, as a town or as a school, we cannot allocate your tax dollars, your resources, to promote any questions such as this. So while we, if I'm meeting with someone, I could easily say I think it's great for the town and vote yes on four, but the town can't send a postcard saying vote yes on four because that's your tax dollars that we're sending the postcard with. And so we can't use your dollars to tell you, ask you how to vote. But we will send an informative card to explain 
what the bond entails and why the town voted to put this on the ballot. And so you'll see that in the postcard, in the ad, and so it, it won't be promotional. It will be informational and it will explain why it's on the ballot, why this, is, why this may be the right time. Um, but other than that, it's, it's, as, it's as informational as possible. Uh, it can't be directly promotional. And so we can't put a vote yes on four in front of the municipal office building, but we can put a sticker on our car if we'd like. And as for uh, myself, there's a sign on my lawn, so. <laughs> uh, any other um, people with questions? And then we'll open up to citizens' comments. Would I like to place, uh, place this in record, please? Uh, yeah, certainly. You can hand it to our clerk, Mr. Budge. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, so that will conclude the, uh, the question and answer and presentation Thanks. portion of our meeting. Um, if there's anyone who would like to speak at our citizens' comments uh, portion, um, I don't know. Um, Ms. Healy, did anyone sign up? No one signed up. If anyone wanted to speak who didn't sign up, you're welcome to come up to the microphone and have three minutes. Okay, uh, hearing no others, we're going to move on to the rest of our agenda. Uh, I know this is when most of you leave because the rest is boring, but thank you all very much <laughs> for coming out this evening. We appreciate all of your support. Thank you. Thank you. And the biggest thing I tell people is please remember when you vote, turn your ballot over. The ballot questions are on the back. Don't forget. And right now oh, it's eight to two thunder. Red Sox. <laughs> Anyone wondering? <laughs> Thanks for coming. We just missed the best game of the American League Championship Series tonight, everybody. <laughs> okay. Thank you, everyone. So uh, moving on with our agenda um, for routine items. Uh, if I could have a motion to seal the executive session minutes of October 16, 2018. I have a motion from Ms. Hoskins. Second. And a second from Ms. Hildebrand. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, motion passes unanimously. Um, and I can disclose that no votes were taken in the executive session of October 16, 2018. For a consent agenda, um, before I ask for exemptions, I'm going to exempt items E3 and E8. Any other members have any other items on the consent agenda they would like to exempt this evening? Okay, hearing none, I'd ask for a motion to approve the non-exempted consent agenda items. I have a motion, Ms. Hoskins, a second, Mr. Robert Jones. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Passes unanimously. Excuse me. Um, we're going to be withdrawing items E3 and 8 from the agenda um, by administration request. So we're just going to let those fall off. Um, for unfinished business, 2018-19 uh, school budget. Um, yeah, and Mrs. King is uh, unfortunately ill this evening. Uh, but. Dr. Ajay, nothing don't have anything to discuss? On a or B. Uh, I think we've uh, covered future bonds and exist future bonds. Uh, CIP, existing bond? Yep. Yeah, Mr. Jones. I, I don't mean to keep those <coughs> stage, so I'll be very brief. Um, I just want to address a point that was made, and I didn't want to belabor it when anyone else is here. Um, I believe it's November, and we can double check that. But in November every year, we have sent to the town and to the Asset Management Committee a detailed request um, that outlines last year's outline 60 something pages had 62 million dollars worth of items that prioritize from priority one to five um, that the school leadership and the school committee felt um, were items that the asset management committee needed to look at at formulating its plan every single one of those items or every single item that's in the bond was in that list. So, um, you know, there is no surprises in terms of what we asked for. Now, could we fund, you know, a $2,000 eyewash separately? Maybe. But some of the, the implementation of this is these things are done over the summer. These things are done at certain windows. It makes sense to bundle them and do it in a certain way. Um, so I just sort of take exception to saying that there is lack of clarity in the process. You can go to our website and look at a 350 page document um, in our budget of which 20% is all capital items in terms of the cost and why and the priority. 
Um, and there's 270 other pages of details on where every dollar gets sent and every dollar gets requested and everything else you want to know about the district. So I, again, I just for the record want to say that whatever politics and stuff are involved in terms of you know, how sausage is made, from the school district's end, all those items are sent forward in a very clear, concise, prioritized manner, starting from the district leadership through the school committee to vet those. And uh, I'm just going to add a little. I'm just going to add a little bit to that, which is um, there's a lot of discussion as to the role of the Asset Management Commission, and, and you heard this evening um, some comments with respect to that. Um, when you read the town charter you'll see, as Mr. Mollis mentioned, that the Asset Management Commission has a very specific purpose. It serves a very useful purpose, and uh, we do submit our submissions to them, and we uh, are very interested in the advice um, that they give. Um, and even in the uh, quote from the charter that was read tonight, it says that the uh, primary purpose of the Asset Management Commission is to formulate an a, a capital improvement plan and an asset protection plan to be presented to the town council. And they have some specific goals, which talk about projecting expenditures, projecting public facilities, developing programs, and um, generating and seeking alternative funding for capital and asset protection projects for both the town and school facilities. All that's correct. The word that's missing that, that is sort of interpreted in there by some folks in town is the word approve. Um, there's nowhere in the charter that talks about the Asset Management Commission approving things. Um, they're an advisory committee, and while we welcome their advice, um, you know, for someone to say that we didn't receive the approval of the Asset Management Commission on, on particular items, it's just not part of the charter and not part of the Asset Management Com Commission's uh, role. So uh, my two cents on just some of the comments that you heard this evening. Well, and to just piggyback, and I think it lends to the point that certain people made in their questions here, is depending on how the vote goes in November, but if, if this bond is approved and we do go forward and put in the complex, I, for one, you know, expect for our CIPs going forward to include, you know, one-tenth, one-eighth, one-twelfth, whatever the right number is to replace the turf field and that we need to set aside that every year. So 10 years from now, 12 years from now, whatever, we're not sitting here, you know, with whatever the committee is there going, where are we going to find a million dollars to replace the turf? We should already have that escrowed so it just rolls right into replacing it. So obviously that ultimate decision is the town council's, um, but I hope this committee starts asking that to be a set aside um, if this project is approved. And just one last little bit, and Mr. Mollis mentioned this as well, but uh, keep in mind with respect to the school side as well as the town, um, assuming, or not assuming, but uh, if the bond is approved, um, that's when a lot of our hard work begins. And I'll just mention the committee, um, we saw a bit of uh, presentation on the different options for turf and things like that. Um, there's a uh, subcommittee that's been meeting. As you know, we can't have more than two school committee members on any subcommittee, but there's a subcommittee that consists of uh, the architect, Mr. Mollis, the uh, um, uh, the athletic director, the school principal, all of uh, uh, that group has been meeting to sort of hedge out uh, and recommend some items with respect to a lot of those nitty-gritty decisions. But uh, come the uh, uh, result of the bond, if it's approved at our very next meeting, we're going to have to be making some very final decisions on, you know, what types of those three types of grass are we going to be using? What are we going to be using for an infill? Um, we're going to have to move pretty quickly on that um, and uh, come to some votes and get these proposals out to bid, as uh, Dr. Ajay mentioned, so that you know we're ready to go, uh, put uh, spades and uh, things in the ground uh, come the end of the school year. Okay, anyone else uh, have any comments on CIP existing or future bond? Um, for new business, in your uh, packets we have um, some special reports which included a data summary uh, with some enrollment information um, as well as a disposal notification. Any questions or comments on those reports? And also the financial report was in there as well. I mention every time that one comes up, uh, anyone who has any questions regarding transparency with respect to the school budget, that um, financial report uh, shows the current status of our budget as well as a listing of every non-payroll check basically issued by the school department in alphabetical and numerical order uh, that you can take a look at what the expenditures have been since the report was last run. Uh, any questions on those reports? Okay, hearing none, we've reached the end of our agenda. I would ask for a motion to adjourn. I have a motion second. from Ms. Hoskins, second Mr. Robert Jones. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. We are adjourned. Thank you all for coming, and thank you for staying till the end. You get free tickets <laughs> to the next meeting. <laughs>